Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode on the Home Tech Talk podcast. My name is Jake. And my name is Aiden. On this episode, we went down to Melbourne and caught up with Dave from Bright Green. Dave, welcome to the podcast. G'day, guys. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Melbourne. Thanks for having us here in your showroom. Super yeah, yeah. interesting space. There's plenty going on. Yeah, there certainly is. Uh, we're basically all the all the nerds are here, so <laughs> all the software, electronic, and mechanical engineers in one spot. So cool. So. And you've only just met us, so we're another couple of nerds coming down here. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> we can nerd out. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess we might go straight into it. So we're here today at Bright Green, and if you wanted to give a bit of a background to Bright Green and the story that led you guys here today. Yeah, sure. Well, we're, we're product designers, and back in the day, we used to design products to break. Uh, because we were, you know, mandated by large corporations and we thought, wouldn't it be great to go and do our own thing and design things to last? Uh, and around the same time, I was uh, with my brother and I was just literally hanging out having a beer and he was next to this uh, compact fluorescent lamp and he said, I look really ugly under that, that light. And I was like, I don't know if I can help with that, but, you know, maybe the thing we should be creating is, is some really high quality, super efficient, long lasting um, carbon neutral lights. And so we set about designing um, an LED light, just as LED was taking off at the time, and we set to bake the an equivalent to the 50 watt halogen at the time, which was absolutely ubiquitous within all Australian builds. And we thought, can we do what's being done in 50 watts in in 10 watts? Can we get the same output? Can we get the same light quality? Can we get the same dimmability and control? And so uh, that was the beginning of a two year or so journey to prototype, design, fabricate, um, just at the uh, the beginning of the GFC, which is a great time to start a business. <laughs> yeah. Yep, sure is. Uh, but two years later, uh, out popped um, D900 Classic, which is the, the world's first downlight to match 50 watt halogen. And uh, we had just landed in Melbourne out of Perth uh, when we launched it. So it was fabulous timing. And I think we were, you know, as you, as you are two years in, to a business without any revenue, you know, you're sort of at the edge of things. So things have to succeed pretty quickly. And it just so happened, I think the World Cup was on at the time and Australia just lost to Germany the night before, six uh, nil in the soccer, the football. And um, I knew a few uh, football fans here that also owned building companies. So we just sent them a little email with a soccer pitch background and it just said Australia won, Germany zero. <laughs> and I think the, the first builder from Beckton building at Tower here called us up and says, I'll take $100,000, you know, and we're, and we're off and running. And, and now we're, you know, 80 staff and exporting around the world. Wow, what a story. And many more products in the line. A lot more. And the thing we're known for now is just that light quality, the thing that, you know, Baz, my brother, had started, you know, with. So we, we, we set out to pursue just solely to make him look good. That's the, <laughs> that's the, How's that's that the working? entire purpose of the company. Have we, have we got there? <laughs> He's lost a bit of hair. <laughs> saying that. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, ev everything and everybody looks better under true colour. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. But uh, <laughs> I'll have to ask his wife. Better, <laughs> better on that one. Well, that's a good segue into True Colour. If you wanted to give us, our audience a bit of an understanding about your representation on True Colour. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think everyone will know that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see the front cover of the Dark Side of the Moon, Pink, the Pink Floyd album, and you'll see, a, you know, a white bit of light going into a prism and there's colours coming out the side. And anyone that's done, you know, up to Year 9 Science, <laughs> which is... Most of your audience will know that there's there's colours mixed together in that white light. That's what makes it white light, right? Um, but when you split out those colours, uh, some of them are missing uh, in normal uh, efficient lighting. So normal LEDs are missing uh, a lot of uh, greens and yellows. So uh, the big one that's missing is red. So red is, red is normally missing. And we measured this um, with uh, a fancy machine called a spectral power distribution meter. And that gives us the, the spectrum of light and it gives us the amount and volume of color in there. So if I have, uh, say, 20% of a, out of 100 out of, uh, of red light and it bounces off something red, I'm only going to see 20% of that red light reflected. So if something's like a really nice, beautiful red tomato and I'm only hitting it with uh, a low R9 light, which is common, common in the market, it will just look flat and brown. And so you won't see its vibrancy, you won't see it really coming to life. Um, and so True Colour 
seeks to um, enliven everything, every colour, every object, every material, every face, and to bring it to life. And so our R9s, particularly just for that, that red wavelength, is uh, about 95 to 96, which is uh, the highest in the world. And for, for CRI, which is the colour rendering units, which is an average of all those colours, that's basically you know, taking all the colours that are spitting out of that prism on dark side of the moon and averaging them out, or averaging eight of them out, um, then we score 98. So uh, again, the highest CRI in the world, the highest light quality in the world. So this, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big pursuit. We, we spent a lot of time on mixing uh, phosphors and optics and the lighting control itself, which all come together into a package to create you know, an amazing visual experience, um, but also, and this is probably one of the most important parts, a consistent one. So every single luminaire is coming with this same light quality uh, because the, something happens in your brain. You put a low light quality light next to a high light quality light, the, the low light quality just looks awful straight away. And if you've got that low light quality or mixed light quality hitting the same material, like a flooring, oh, it looks like a completely different space and it's not uniform. We, we almost say to people, just match your light quality. So people will come in to say us here and they've got, they say, oh, I've got some, you know, 80 CRI lights that uh, well, electrician got from a wholesaler. And they say, well, this looks fabulous. We should put this in. And we're like, just go and, go and stick with the old bad light quality. <laughs> like put it all together. Don't mix it up because, you know, you, you'll, be, you'll be better off not knowing the comparison in the space. It's like all in or don't, you know, all out like that. That's basically it. So that's true color in a, in a nutshell. It makes yeah. things look good. Yeah. Brings everything to life. Yeah, wow. And so that's one of the phenomenon that I've been, I mean, color temperature also plays into that, but the CRI is definitely the thing that you kind of grab with colors. But I see people not matching color temperature as well. So like they'll have not the same CRI rating, but they'll also just have totally different colors in a space. And I'm like, this looks so strange. Like you see, you know, a 4,000 Kelvin light next to a, you know, 2800 Kelvin light and it's just, it's bizarre. That's painful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, do. I didn't even raise it because I'm like, that's, 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 that's like yeah. breaking one of the cardinal sins. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, absolutely. It's, it's very disturbing to see that. I think coordinating it and, you know, that's what, you know, some of our dynamic spectrum lights, the ones that are changing color temperature and changing the way people feel. We can get, in, get into that in a sec, but, um, the, the ones that can be coordinated so that the color temperature matches um, can be controlled in such a way so that it is uniform across the, across the space. Or, and this is the other thing, is to um, match the other fabulous source of light. There's this thing called the sun. I don't know if you heard of it. It's one of my <laughs> favorites. <laughs> you know, for sure. It's, it's here there. with us every day. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's the thing we've evolved to tune ourselves into. You know, that's the, that is the benchmark, of course in uh, not light quality, not just light quality, but also it's uh, color temperature. So, you know, that, that really white light that comes out during the middle of the day, if you can take your artificial lighting and, and to match that white light, um, all it does in your brain is bring that outdoor light deeper into the space. You know, so if you've got some sunlight coming through from uh, some windows and, and then it gets a bit darker further in, if you transition through from that projected light from the sun deeper into the space and match the color temperature and transition the intensity, all you feel is, wow, this place is like really beautiful and well lit with sunlight, you know. It's a much more enjoyable space to inhabit. So much more. And a lot of that, you know, that delivery to be able to match the sunlight is partly the color temperature selection, partly the control and making it dynamic. But the most important element in all of it is the actual lighting design, projecting it onto the space uh, so that in, in this particular case for sunlight, a lot of the time it's overhead lighting so that it feels like it is, you know, projected from up above. And if, if the light is casting in a particular direction, like you've got a northern aspect uh, window, for instance, and it's got some cast light onto the floor, um, using uh, forms of light to continue that, that orientation within the space because our, our brain just subliminally clicks it all together and it goes, oh, that's sunlight, this feels, this feels good. But if you've got you know, light shadowing the opposite direction to the sun, then your brain goes, oh, this feels a bit weird. What's going on here? You know, so. That phenomenon that we're talking about is called a few different names. It's human-centric lighting, it's circadian lighting, and that's the ability to transition that colour temperature and you know, other elements within the lighting design, but the colour temperature primarily through the 
through the course of the day. Absolutely. To match the sun. Yeah. I think, you know, human centric lighting is really around all the behavioral aspects that go into um, a lighting design, like, uh, you know, overhead making you feel a little bit more stimulated and low level lighting make you feel a, a bit more relaxed, like a campfire. Um, and then circadian specifically is mostly around the stimulation of light on this uh, magic little cell in your eye called a ganglion cell. And, and that only really comes from overhead lighting. And so it's blue light that hits this cell and your body goes into this, this, the beginning of a day every time it gets enough intensity. So it's like resetting the start of a day every time you get enough intensity of that. So you don't want to read the start of the day at six o'clock at night, mm. right? So yeah. you want to be in, you know, over the hump and heading down into, into rest mode. So um, that's why we avoid blue screens with our phones and that's why we, you know, wear blue filtering glasses and, and so on in, in extreme circumstances. It's to avoid that, that particular wavelength of light, which is the blue light, and it's known as uh, melanopic lux. And so when they're doing lighting design, you're designing so that the melanopic lux can be controlled uh, using automation system uh, throughout the day on different circuits, changing the intensity that's hitting the eye through either placement, which is the lighting design, or the color temperature control or the dimming level. So we're doing those three and we're coordinating it together so that you can get maximum focus uh, during the day and maximum rest and depth of rest during, during the night. And there's so many studies on this and maybe, uh, you know, there might be some graphics that you've got, I'll, t I'll send you for this, but there's, there's hundreds of studies that have been done by all those fabulous universities, um, Harvard being one of the big ones because they get right into the built environment. And uh, I think they're showing things like by following this circadian rhythm and reinforcing it with the, with the light, you're increasing focus and productivity by 20%, test scores for kids by 14%. It's... It goes on and on and on. The, the health benefits and the psychological benefits are just ridiculous. Um, and the great thing is it's automated. Yeah, just happens. It just happens. And so you don't have to, you know, it's not like some other life choice where you have to keep at it. You don't have to get out of bed and run that 10Ks anymore every morning to keep it up. You have to keep hitting those vegetables and eating, <laughs> drinking those green smoothies. It's just like, you know, you guys take care of the automation. You know, we take care of the light and the lighting design and, and the system works yeah, as a synergy together in order to increase your well-being. Talking a bit more about automation systems, I think the great question to ask would be, do you have any favourites and what sort of benefits would you be looking for in an automation system? Oh, that's, that's a great question. That's a really, that's a really, that's a really intelligent one. Um, look, I, I think the classic mix that I love, if there's, if there's you know, budget and there's quality, you know, in mind, then like everybody, a good savant front end with a control for back end is probably probably the mix. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn. I don't know if you guys, that's, yeah. that's what you yeah, back. That's, that's what fine. you back. And then, you know, there's, there's the low end accessibility side of things, which is, you know, um, for everybody, you know, because not everybody's going to be necessarily in that space. So, you know, there's uh, optimizations, I guess, to create things that are a little bit you easier. You guys have your own like control like system, do we, do we not? Like we have a control system that you can just automate this color shifting process without a full-blown automation platform in the background? Yeah, you can. I mean, what we're doing is we've got our uh, all of our drivers for color shifting. Uh, each luminaire is controlled and those drivers can either be uh, a control wide control protocol like DALI, which you could control for up to, for instance. Uh, or Zigbee, which you can also hook control for up to. But if you wanted the the more, you know, um, prosumer DIY type territory type uh, system, then there is uh, other Zigbee platforms that that can control that that dynamic color temperature tuning, and all our lights connect to those systems. Um, that's for CCT tuning, which changes the color temperature and the brightness independently. But we also have just a really simple system, night shift, which dims uh, to warm. So as you dim down, it goes from 3,100 Kelvin down to 1,800, which is like the embers of a fire. And at the, at the most basic level, um, we've literally had the first box of the production line off today. We have Zigbee mechs that, you know, you can push five times and connect to anything Zigbee. So you could connect this to Hue at the cheapest level. You know, if you wanted to be $79 and, you know, connect this up and then you can just say, hey, Siri, you know, 
hit hit a uh, caveman mode, <laughs> and uh, and all the lights on that circuit because all our lights are phase dimmable out of the box will just dim down. So you know the complete end of the spectrum. So I think it's you know what is the best automation system? You know you're asking. I think you know at the top end it's like give me all the bells and whistles, like which is all the expertise that you guys absolutely nail. And um, you know then there's uh, close enough is good enough, which I don't know if it's necessarily your market, which is sort of... I mean, one of the things for people looking into that space to be aware of is that not all downlights that dim, dim well. And that's kind of one of the specialties of Bright Green. That's how I came to be aware of Bright Green was that their actual dimming curve and the, the way the compatibility with different platforms was much like much more compatible than anything else in the market. Absolutely. Uh, look, that's, that's uh, after we designed that, that light, the world's first 50 halogen, we set about designing drivers. And, and the reason was we started to push these things out to the market. And this was 12, 13 years ago. And I think, uh, you know, the, the big system at the time was Clipsal CBUS. And so, uh, and it wasn't working very well with anybody's new LEDs. Uh, so we worked pretty closely with Clipsal Integrated Systems to design uh, our own custom set of drivers and they were, all the electronics were optimized for that CBUS system in the beginning. And then as soon as we did that, it started, you know, and, you know, Crestron was on us and, you know, Control 4 eventually, I think there was, that was very big five years ago. I think they sent all their stuff off to the States and we were optimizing our electronics so that that uh, dimming curve or the, you know, the, the firing angle of the triac wave was being, read by our IC on the actual uh, driver and and determining what product that was, what it was trying to do, and then optimising the uh, dimming signal on the other side to our light. And, and we're running it through, uh, we're getting a bit nerdy. Yeah, here. this is <laughs> well nerdy. <laughs> nerdy Sorry, the integrated circuits and derp, derp, derp. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the outcome was like, it was dimming our lights at 70,000 hertz, which is, you know, Usually it's, it's 500 times a second if you're lucky on a, on a dimmable driver. So we're doing it 70,000 times a second, which means, um, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys will see this video and there's, there'll be nothing flickering. And, you know, videos look amazing. Slow-mo videos look amazing. Photos look amazing. And here's the other thing with ultra high frequency. You're, if, it, you're, if lights are flashing on and off 500 times a second, your brain's still seeing it. But at 70,000 hertz, it's not doing any work at all. So you're super calm and super comfortable. So yeah, dimming compatibility is, it's got to work and it's got to dim low. And that's really where we started. And then it's ended up in sort of an extreme case of um, assisting with the, the light quality, um, the visual aesthetic and the, the comfort and therefore the, the overall wellness of the uh, lighting experience. And is that why your range has expanded so greatly is to accommodate the rest of the requirements for that like wellness space creation with the different light angles you know you've got lots of wall lights lots of like little low pin lights for stairs and now we're doing heaps of concealed led strip yep indeed uh, every light has a purpose and uh, we we have designed these things to do a specific job i think uh, like i mentioned earlier you know down lights are prolific were prolific uh and they are there everywhere they're an easy easy fix and they have their place you know they're there to focus light on a, a specific space that is usually static. So, you know, a kitchen bench, it's not going anywhere, right? It's, 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 it's fixed in, it's marble, and we're directly trying to eliminate that. But there's other dynamic focuses. So you might have artworks on a wall or feature furniture that is moving over time. So, you know, you need to then accommodate that with... Um, small track lights that move in and out. These ones are magnetic and they s snap into a system. Or uh, this particular uh, light here, specifically for artwork, they can change its shape to only focus on the artwork. Um, so those two layers where you're like really focusing in on things are really, you know, the first step. And, and but taking the steps further, you then have um, other layers that you want to create in the lighting design. So. The three main ones would be uh, overhead in direct lighting where you wash the roof with light. And that creates a really nice uniform background layer of illumination um, so that you know everything is illuminated very uh, evenly at a low level uh, so that you can then focus these sorts of things on highlight areas so they visually stand out. Um, and the overhead lighting 
again, is great for spaces where you want to feel a little bit awake and a little bit focused. So, you know, that's all of your, your lounge rooms and your uh, kitchens and any uh, home office, anywhere you want to feel, you know, um, like you're productive, productive. Exactly. Um, and then you kind of go down onto the architecture, onto the walls where you, you want to have a background layer there too. You don't just want just focus lights. So that's where things like this, these come in with these strip lights, which are, uh, designed to sit into the roof and, and wash a wall um, so that we get a really uniform background illumination of light. But these things just disappear into the ceiling. They're really concealed and hidden. Like pretty much, that's probably the biggest lighting trend of 2023 and onwards is just hide the light. So that that's part of that. And then, yes, like you said before, you know, the, the low level lighting, uh, like low level orientation lighting, um, there's heaps of uh, benefit in having the low level lighting for, to navigate. Um, but it, it also, that low level light, like we said before, is really calming. So in these transitional spaces like hallways or um, a place that you would be occupying pre-sleep, like a, a cinema room um, or the bedroom, of course, keeping these lights really, really low um, means that it's not hitting that ganglion cell stimulating you. And you have this beautiful association of like low level light. It's very, very calming. Um, and it's all you need, you know, you don't need, uh, you just need to see where you're going, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very practical as well. So if you layer those things up, you know, at the, at a base level, you get what we, what we'd say is probably the fundamentals of a good lighting design, um, which is what we, we offer, we help architects out and, you know, automators and things like yourselves as a service to, to, to lay that out. And there's also fabulous lighting designers out there in Australia. We have some re a really great field of them and they'll, they'll be doing similar things to start with. Um, and then, you know, it gets, it can get very specific to someone's needs after that, you know, where you t start talking about what's their lifestyle and, you know, w what's their, what's their intended way of being within this space? Like, are they, you know, are they going to reoccupy this space and try to become fitter? Are they trying to, you know, do yoga every Sunday in this particular room? And, you know, is this person getting up before that person? Like, you know, you really get into those behavioral, um, needs and that's where I think the lighting design becomes really interesting when it connects together with the automation. You know, you start automating things in connection and you really make those things mesh together and you end up with like a very unique architectural experience. And it isn't, you know, it's best practices, sort of what we we're talking about before, like getting it really now and just using the best techniques. But when you get something that's custom fitted to the space and the people, it's it's uh, there's nothing like it, and then you know, an automation a, system to tie it together, so you don't have to go and like recreate those exact light levels every single evening, or you know go around this light, this level, exactly dim, that. You know, just one button or just one button timed events. Yeah, Precisely and I think that. having an automation system with a good lighting design is really something that that can leverage each other. You know, and that's something that we do with automation systems is create like scenes or light scenes and having a having layered lights really helps absolutely you know, not really a scene if you're not creating something <laughs> totally you know if it was at a at a circuit level you know you have might have four circuits doing four different jobs like we had the layers in the room but you could have 16 scenes potentially or six options of 16 scenes i should say um out of those there might be any four that have utility or benefit but you have that with a lot more options as a result of it you're absolutely right um, but we can be specific to the outcome. I think that's where it comes down to the coordination of the, um, you know, the, the architect, the client, the, the automation team and, and, the, and the lighting team so that we're all focused on the same intended outcome um, to maximise impact. And I see you've got some new products there that also hit that um, minimalistic make the lights disappear type scenario that everyone's chasing at the moment. Absolutely. Look, um, we just releasing this uh, today, so when I think it goes to market, we'll be uh, up and up, fully up and running. This is the the usual size of a downlight, for instance, and it's 700 lumens. These are our new ones, and they're 700 lumens. Uh, these ones are actually plaster in. So you'll see the little you know dots around the sides. You can actually plaster to edge, and like you said, the minimal hidden. Uh, the light just disappearing is the is the biggest trend going forward. We we conducted a survey last year with a, a few hundred architects, and their their number one was make the light disappear. Uh, their number two was 
uh, wellness and automation, and number three was sustainability. So you know that that's architects saying you know this is what's happening in in architecture and lighting in in twenty twenty three. So yeah, we're right on the button with that. All of our new downlights tracks. Um, These are uh, actually incredible when you look at it. Like they're actually one of my biggest gripes is the installation process and whether it's been considered. So like the actual so, entire so fitting true. slides through the oh, look. in part and then it's also can be gimbaled internally. Wow. Absolutely. And here's something that you won't see uh, in any of those small lights in the market and already our distributors that distribute a lot of other Italian brands are asking us, please, can they sell them to us individually? But they come with the lights. These are, these are drivers I was just going to ask you, is that the driver? They fit through the hole cut out and these are wow. miniaturized versions of our um, high frequency digital automation optimized drivers. So hole cut out straight through because yeah, all the drivers are bigger than the holes like that for these, for these small lights. So if you go for, you know, the classic other Italian brands, for instance, you'll find they're, they're quite large. and uh, Yeah, they have to do remote driver installations, which is, you know, it's a nightmare for everyone. Well, well. In some countries where you don't have, you know, uh, the same cost of installation, you know, it might not have the same demand. But in Australia, we're, we're pretty much number one in, in, in the world for the cost of installation. So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to nail, you have to make sure that you're, you're putting all the products in that are going to be uh, maximising that value, right? That's why experts like yourselves, you know, you have, you guys are choosing products that you know very well, you have so much experience in it, and you have specialists that are installing you know, where you're not ending up with a, uh, an additional price tag for the value that you're creating. Yep. No, awesome. I love the look of all these little <laughs> new little not models. Not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you're spending money in the actual hardware and engineering as opposed to the installation process. Like Indeed. It keeps the installation relatively simple. I mean, rendering in lights is never easy, but, you know, if the whole light works appropriately, then it sort of makes that a little bit more palatable. Absolutely. And if, you know, people aren't rendering in lights, there's always the, the choice to cut a hole and plonk it in and, yeah. and be a little quicker. Um, so, yeah, you've got to sort of allow for each, uh, all the appetites. Yeah, awesome. We've covered quite a bit of ground today. So thanks for having us here today in, in your showroom. Thanks for coming down to, and to Melbourne, guys. And for anyone who wants to find any more information about Bright Green, where would you send them? Uh, brightgreen.com. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. We hope you enjoyed this episode and if you like content like this, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up to date. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Home Tech Talk and thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.